Can I just try the video sharing first? I mean, the sharing option. Yeah, just try it. Hi guys, uh, welcome to another session of uh, Critical Care Sunday webinars by a forum Young India Intensivist. So today's speaker, Dr. Rohit Nagya, sir, need no introduction. Many of you have attended this session earlier, especially on anti Very nicely, we wanted you one on NIV earlier. So we thank you for his regular contribution to our teaching sessions. And uh, for those of uh, you who may not know him, sir is a pulmonologist. He is a principal director at of pulmonology at Max Hospital Sargate. Apart from pulmonology, he also specializes in infectious diseases and in critical care, which is I think very remarkable. So today's topic is uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, very important to all critical care specialists and pulmonologists and physicians. And uh, we'll be talking about aspiration pneumonia also. As far as community acquired pneumonia is concerned, we've already taken the session. It's up there on our YouTube channel. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, sir. We'll take the questions in the end. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Tapesh. At the outside, I must congratulate you for running the show successfully for the past so many weeks. It's really commendable that you've been doing it so perfectly well and uh, really been successful with it. So I think without wasting much time, I'll start my presentation for this evening. Just a minute. So ventilator associated pneumonia is what I'm going to be talking about today for the rest hour or so. By definition, we have two definitions that we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. One is the hospital acquired pneumonia and then is a ventilator associated pneumonia. For hospital acquired pneumonia, it has to be a new lung infiltrate plus a clinical evidence that the infiltrate is of infectious origin, which would include the onset of new fever, purulent sputum, leukocytosis, and a decline in oxygenation levels. And this has to happen after 48 hours of hospitalization. That means patient should have been in the hospital for at least 48 hours before you label him to be having a HAP or a VAP. VAP automatically means that a new lung infiltrate plus clinical evidence of all this in a patient who's on a ventilator for the previous 48 hours. Only then would you label it as VAP. Amongst the various infections that can happen in a hospital, that means amongst the various nosocomial infections or hospital acquired infections, respiratory infections tend to be the highest in number. They tend to be leading the show as far as nosocomial infections are concerned. So if 100%, I mean, amongst the, the hospital acquired pneumonias, we classify them into two parts, the non-ICU hospital acquired pneumonias and the ICU hospital acquired pneumonias. ICU hospital acquired pneumonias are about one third. And then amongst them, WAP is the predominant infection. That is about 86% of the total ICU acquired infections would be WAP. Uh, quoting some Canadian experience that WAP was the leading cause of death amongst hospital acquired infections. The hospital mortality of ventilated patients amongst those who developed WAP was seen to be 46%. And those who did not develop WAP was 32%. It resulted in increased number of days of ventilation by almost a week, an ICU stay of more than a week, and total stay by almost two weeks. Deaths in these critically ill patients was additionally high to the extent of 6 to 30%. When we look at the burden of the disease in India, sorry, globally, it occurs in about 9 to 27% of all intubated patients. 2.1 to 10.7 episodes of VAP have been reported per 1,000 ventilator days. It is associated with a crude mortality rate of more than 20% or greater if a high-risk pathogen is involved. It is twice as likely to die compared with those without VAP. It results in a significantly longer duration of mechanical ventilation and hospital length of stay. And of course, it automatically means that overall costs would go up by $10,000 to $40,000 at times, as compared to people who do not acquire WAP. If we look at the epidemiology in India, there are studies from various parts of our country, different ICU, surgical ICU, cardiac ICU, medical ICU, 
overall it is somewhere between 16 to 54 percent of the patients on ventilator who develop VAT. and mortality if you see here is 37 to 47 percent the risk of VAP is highest early in the course of the hospital stay and the crude mortality could go up to 70 percent coming on to the etiopathogenesis of this dreaded disease dreaded complication in a hospital in a patient who's on ventilator for any infection to happen there has to be a combination of three things a, an appropriate host the environment and the microbe so let's look at the host factors first as a normal individual there would be a normal defense mechanism towards any infection or invasion in our body so the initial uh, responses to an infection start from the glottis level larynx if there's anything going trying to enter into the the airways the larynx would automatically the vocal cords would automatically induce a cough and prevent this from happening so an appropriate cough reflex is very very important then natural mucociliary clearance where the bacteria or the particles or the dust they're all cleared up naturally by the mucociliary mechanisms the presence of polymorphonuclear leukocytes and their recruitment appropriately at the site of infection and then the appropriate uh, functioning macrophages and their respective cytokines the presence of antibodies igm igg iga and the complements so any deficiency at any of these levels would make an individual susceptible of developing any kind of an infection and especially when you're talking of VAP. then there are other host factors that we need to take into mind especially when the patients are on multiple antibiotics being given systemically the role of this is unclear but the prior administration of antibiotics has had an adjusted ratio of 3.1 for developing VAP. it predisposes patients to subsequent colonization and infection with antibiotic resistant pathogens then there are other causes that need to be taken in consideration these are the thermal injury patients post-traumatic head injury patients post-surgical patients impaired consciousness coma immunosuppression multi-organ involvement severity of the underlying illness like ARDS happening in elders it is more common those more than 60 years of age and in the presence of comorbidities like COPD yet other factors are patients who have undergone a cpr they are more prone to developing a wap patients on continuous sedation patients who've been extubated and then reintubated the chances of wap are higher that is why we always prefer that the extubation should be absolutely safe maybe a day later but it should only happen when you're absolutely confident that yes now on the patient would be able to manage on his own so reintubation is something which is associated with greater incidence of VAP. The presence of nasogastric tube, that is why we've now moved on to orogastric tube, enteral feeding, there's always a chance of bloating in the abdomen and resulting in aspiration. Transportation of the patient out of the ICU, in and out when you move the patient, they're always ambuing the patient and other ventilator being disconnected, reconnected, interfering with the circuit, all that can result in increase in VAP. And for some reason, it's the male gender which is associated with higher incidence of VAP. Now, there are three particular reservoirs of infection in our body when we're dealing with, when you're talking about VAP that you have to keep in mind. The oropharynx, the sinuses, and the upper GI tract. These are the sites from where aspiration is most likely into the lungs. So, Normally in the oropharynx, we have the GPCs and the anaerobic bacteria, but then if patients have a gingival or dental, dental plaques, they rapidly become colonized in less than 12 hours with aerobic pathogens, especially in the ICU patients due to poor oral hygiene and lack of mechanical elimination. So they tend to develop gingivitis with aerobic organisms now, where anaerobic was initially common, now they're getting colonized with aerobic organisms. Then we have the sinuses. The cumulative incidence of nosocomial sinusitis appears to be approximately 8%. This incidence is sub substantially higher amongst patients who are mechanically ventilated and have already an underlying sinusitis on a CT scan done prior. As many as 70% of such patients may develop nosocomial sinusitis. Sinusitis itself 
substantially increases the risk of VAP with an odds ratio of 3.66. That means if somebody has an sinusitis, these patients would be more prone to developing VAP, almost three times higher than somebody who does not have a sinusitis. Then gastric colonization with gram-negative bacteria is a very common finding in critically ill patients. Many studies have demonstrated simultaneous gastric colonization and infection of the lungs with bacteria of the same species. Colonization and subsequently VAP increase with the increase in gastric pH using H2 blockers, antacids, or PPIs. Bile fluid itself is very, very pro-inflammatory uh, kind of a fluid. So if this was to aspirate it into lungs, then definitely that would also result in a VAP. Not keeping the patient supine can also be a, uh, sorry, not keeping a patient in a semi-recumbent position can also be uh, making the patient more susceptible to catching VAP. This was a study of 20, of 86 patients where they showed that 23% of the supine patients versus only 5% who were semi-recumbent developed VAP. Therefore, positioning of the patient is very, very important. Whenever we are introducing any kind of a foreign body inside the body, like a central line or a uh, endotracheal tube, it tends to get colonized by bacteria. That's a universal phenomena to happen. Gradually, this colonization results in the bacteria result in exudation of a polymer sheath, polymeric substance or matrix that then forms a biofilm. A high percentage of patients have their airway colonized based on the ED aspirate surveillance cultures that have been done mostly by Acinobacter and Pseudomonas. The microorganisms then attach to the synthetic substance, multiply and develop an extracellular polymeric substance or a matrix in which they remain protected from the antibiotics and also tend to exist for much longer. Because this biofilm provides a kind of a protective environment to these pathogenic organisms. The bacterial survival in an ET tube biofilm can actually promote VAP and microbial persistence and consequently affect patient prognosis. Patients, uh, 70 to 95% of the endotracheal tubes develop biofilms sooner or later and in 56% the same microorganisms are grown in ET aspirate as also in the biofilm. Then when you're introducing the, into the endotracheal tube into the airways, into the trachea, there's a local trauma and inflammation that gets triggered off by the endotracheal tube, maybe a little bit of traumatization or by just its presence. So the trachea also gets colonized and there's, of course, a reduced clearance of these organisms from the lower respiratory tract. This is a study of about 110 patients. 25 patients developed VAP. 22 had their trachea colonized three and a half days prior to diagnosis of VAP. And 17 of the 22 patients had oropharyngeal colonization prior to trachea. Only seven had prior colonization of stomach. So you can see this study highlights that the colonization could be in the stomach, in the trachea, around the ET tube, in the oropharynx, anywhere really, and result in VAP. Next thing that we need to remember or keep in mind are the environmental factors. So, so far we were talking about the host factors, how the host becomes more susceptible to developing a VAP. Now looking at the environmental factors, there can be various factors in a patient's environment that could result, that could contribute towards a development of a VAP. First of all, are the ventilatory circuits, the tubings, the filters, the humidifiers, the suction catheters, the nebulizers that are used, they all break the circuit and allow bacteria and viruses to go inside. Inhalation of aerosol may not be as much of a causative mechanism, but definitely would be contributing to some extent or the other. And it plays a small but a definite role in the development of VAP. Even otherwise, all the, the, if you look at all these surfaces around the patient, the trolley, the bed, the wash basin, we, the healthcare workers who carry bacteria and viruses on our hands, we all make the patient susceptible to developing a VAP. Inadequate infection control practices like poor hand hygiene, not wearing protective gloves and gloves while doing an aseptic procedure, 
then of course as i said infrastructural uh changes like buildings inadequate workspaces inadequate staffing they all make a patient prone to developing wap now we come to the microbes so we spoke about the host factors the environment around the host factors that is making the patient susceptible and now the microbes that which are the microbes that can cause wap wap basically can be classified into two types the early onset which is 0 to 5 days and a late onset which is more than 5 days why do you want to classify them because initially it was thought that the bacteriology would vary the microbial isolation would vary in an early wap and a late wap early wap as i said is considered to be those patients who are developing wap within 5 days of requiring mechanical ventilation and the and also hospitalization and here the bacteria that you would expect would be strep pneumonia h influenza mssa susceptible gram negative bacteria the same bacteria that you would expect in a community acquired setting so it was expected that it would be less severe would have little impact on outcome and mortality would be minimal while late wap what those patients who are developing wap after 5 days of hospitalization or mechanical ventilation and the bacteria that would be isolated then would be the typically the hospital acquired infection bacteria that is the pseudomonas acinobacter mrsa and of course it would result in a higher attributable mortality and morbidity these are studies from india where from gujarat they have shown the most common organisms to be pseudomonas klebsiella mrsa e coli acinobacter mssa and strep pneumoniae from lucknow again pseudomonas mrsa klebsiella acinobacter the common organisms this is another study which has shown that the early onset was seen in 47% and late onset in about 52% of the cases staph aureus and enterobacteria ac were common in the early onset whereas pseudomonas and acinobacter were common in the late onset but what was important was that the acinobacter was 84% resistant to calpenems 66% were mrsa and 75% or esbl positive gram negative bacilli so that means we are dealing with mdr pathogens more than the sensitive pathogens this is a study from west bengal where the early onset wap was enterobacteriaceae and acinobacter and late onset was staph and acinobacter and nearly 70% were drug resistant so we actually the most again the bacteria that you isolate or the microbes that you isolate in your patients would vary from region to region from hospital to hospital from icu to icu from ward to icu however the most common would still be e coli staph klebsiella acinobacter pseudomonas enterococcus faecalis so escape was the mnemonic that was given to these bacteria which were known to cause hospital acquired infections notorious bugs however now we move on to new terms now over the years this was in 2010 that this terminology was introduced this mnemonic was introduced and now we moved on to terminology like carbapenem producing enterobacteriaceae that means sorry carbapenem is producing enterobacteriaceae carbapenem resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumani and stains producing metallobetalactamases this is because over the years these bacteria which were then considered to be notorious have now become super notorious by developing resistant mechanisms even to the commonly used drugs like the carbapenems so we are in a difficult situation now apart from bacteria that i just listed there could also be a reactivation of viruses especially we've seen them in the post covid times we've seen hsv in two patients of hiv where uh, the patient was admitted landed up on the ventilator because of an acute exacerbation of copd and then on bronchoscopy we isolated hsv in these two patients it could be seen in 32 to 64% of the patients requiring prolonged ventilation and the risk factors are worsening respiratory status ards those receiving steroids those immunocompromised may be at higher risk then cmv virus that is a cytomegalovirus increased numbers have been seen in the post covid period observed in nearly 30% of the critically ill patients they may involve the lungs directly but they are again more common in patients with multi organ failure prolonged icu stay and survivors of severe bacterial sepsis may directly involve the lung 
Then, of course, commonly we see fungal pathogens as well. Candida is more or less a colonization. It is not to be treated unless there's uh, the Candida score is high in these patients that I discussed in my previous lecture. Unless it is associated with it, not associated, sorry. Candida has been associated with an increased risk of bacterial VAP, especially with Pseudomonas. So if there is, if you're isolating Candida, then please remember that you may just be dealing with Pseudomonas or any other MDR pathogen, thus implying that the outcome is going to be poorer than otherwise. Aspergillus is also seen in many of the patients who are on ventilator, and they may involve in about 3% of the layered onset VAP. Now looking at certain specific risk factors for certain specific pathogens, Streptococcus pneumonia is more common in smokers, in COPDs, in the absence of antibiotic therapy. MRSA is seen in COPDs, those on steroids, longer duration of mechanical ventilation, prior antibiotics, pseudomonas again in these patients. <coughs> Acinetobacter in patients who have ARDS, head trauma, neurosurgery, gross aspiration, and prior cephalosporin therapy. So we've discussed about the host, we've discussed about the environment, we've discussed about the microbes. So what happens? What is the interaction that happens between the three of these settings? The major mechanism is aspiration around the ET cuff. The minor mechanism includes inhalation from the ventilator circuit, local trauma inflammation caused by the endotracheal tube, translocation of bacteria from the gut, and primary bacteremia. So you have a colonization, which results in pooling of secretion above the tracheal cuff, resulting into micro aspirations along the cuff. There may be tracheal injury, resulting in colonization of the trachea, colonization of the upper respiratory tract, biofilm formation, and WAP subsequently. The bacteria then migrate into the lungs. The certain exogenous stimuli, these exogenous stimuli then directly affect the epithelial cells to increase the generation of IL-8 interleukin 1b, GMCSF, tumor necrosis factor, prostaglandin E2, transforming growth factor and activation of the T cells. The neutrophils are recruited, but they may be dysfunctional. These neutrophils produce various proteases, the human neutrophil proteases and the met matrix metalloproteases. There is this imbalance between the proteases and the antiproteases, which therefore results in the damage to the lungs and finally pneumonia and pneumonia progressing to a fibrotic state. So how do you diagnose VAP? The diagnosis of VAP is based on clinical features, chest x-ray, and microbiology. Clinical features would include fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, a new onset fever basically, tachycardia, tachypnea, altered mental state. Clinically, when you examine these patients, you would get crepts or bronchial breathing. There could be an increase in leukocytes. There could also be a Conversely, a decrease in leukocytes, there will be an increased requirement of oxygen in these patients, and the secretions when aspirated would be purulent. These are the classical features that you would see in a patient with VAP. So, based on these features, there's been a clinical pulmonary infection scoring that can be given to the patients, where you look at the leukocytes, you look at the temperature, you look at the PO2 FiO2 ratio, chest radiograph, and culture of the tracheal aspirate, and give them points 0, 1, and 2. A CPIS score of more than six has a sensitivity of 93% and a specificity of 100% in diagnosing VAP. However, it is no longer being recommended by IDSA. When you get an X-ray done of these patients, there's nothing very specific about the radiology in these patients. It could be bilateral, it could be unilateral, it could be patchy, it could be linear, it could be interstitial, it could be anything. It could be associated with effusion, syndemonic effusions, collapse, atelectasis, anything and everything can be seen on the radiology. In a viral pneumonia, you would get more of an interstitial pattern, peribronchial cuffing, bilateral, perihylar. That is a typical pattern that you would get to see in a viral pneumonia. Fungal pneumonia, again, there could be patchy opacities. Nodular opacities are classical of aspergillus infection but they would also present with consolidations, with cinnamonic effusions. This halo sign 
that is very popular for aspergillus infection, which starts with a small consolidation <coughs> nodule formation with a halo around it. Gradually, there's an increase in the size of the nodule and reduction in the size of the halo. And then finally, an air crescent line is usually more common with mucormycosis and more common when it's angio-invasive infection. What is important is to be able to take a sample of all these patients even before starting an antibiotic. Conventional BAL, that is a bronchoalveolar lavage, allows the clinician to reliably target areas that correspond to areas of infiltrate, identified on radiological imaging, as well as visualize and identify airways with purulent secretions. Endotracheal aspirate is believed that it's unable to differentiate between colonizers of in or infected microbes, but that is actually not so. The other ways of collecting a sample from a low respiratory tract is a blind bowel or specimen brushing or a protected bowel, which avoids contamination with upper airway secretions. Of course, it's associated with higher costs and no evidence that protected bowel is superior over the conventional bowel. But whatever you may do, you have to send a sample. It may be an ED aspirate, the yield of which is about 52%. Sensitivity is anything around 55%, specificity 71%. A non-protected bowel has a yield of 68%, sensitivity of about 83%, specificity about 71%. Then bowel per se is 64% yield with 77% sensitivity and 71% specificity. And bronchial brushings, which has a yield of 80% out of which sensitivity is 95% and specificity 57%. After sending the sample, when you get the cultures, what you have to see is the the CFU count that will help you determine whether this is a colonizer or a pathogenic infection. So for bowel, it has to be a colony count of more than 10 to the power of four. For protected bowel, it has to be more than 10 to the power of four. For a non-protected, for a ET aspirate, it has to be more than 10 to the power of five. And for a protected specimen brush, it has to be 10 to the power of three. So protected specimen brush, which is the best sample that you can take, is you, the colony count should be more than 10 to the power of three. For bronchoalveolar lavage, conventional that we do, it should be more than 10 to the power of four. And for an ED aspirate, it should be 10 to the power of five. <clears throat> is gram staining useful in the microbiological diagnosis of VAP or not? This is a meta-analysis that was published. They actually showed that a potential way to accomplish early therapy may be to use gram stains a negative gram stain was highly predictive of absence of VAP, whereas a positive gram stain is not very specific because it is usually, you would identify multiple organisms. The usual report that you would get is few GPCs with GNB seen, with epithelial cells and macrophages seen. So it may not have as much of a value, but definitely if it is negative, then it has a good value that it's unlikely to be infective. The pool sensitivity of VAP is around 79%. The pool specificity of BAL is about 74%. And uh, <coughs> the odds ratio is very high of it being diagnostic is 16, which is quite high and should therefore bronchoscopy be preferred as a modality of choice for collecting the sample if it is feasible. It has shown to improve decision-making, increases the confidence level, there could actually be a significant change in antibiotics and could help in withdrawing the antibiotics if it is absolutely negative and is associated with lower mortality rates. Again, another meta-analysis which has shown that bronchoscopy, early bronchoscopy in these patients may be advisable, especially to clear out the secretions from within. <coughs> and it resulted in change in antibiotics in significant number of patients. So our practice is if the patient is can, is fit and can tolerate a bronchoscopy, then we would do an early bronchoscopy in these patients because we feel that not just do you get a diagnostic sample, but you're also able to clear up the secretion from within, which also help in resolving the infection to some extent. What do the ICMR guidelines say? They say if you're doubting a HAP, then the respiratory sample should be obtained by spontaneous expectoration, sputum induction, nasotracheal suction, and then subjected to semi quantitative cultures. And when you're suspecting WAP, then the preferred method is collection of the raw respiratory tract samples, depending upon the center expertise, available facilities, and cost issues. Blind endotracheal aspirate is the easiest. 
and associated with similar outcomes. Semi-quantitative cultures should be performed. The ISCCM guidelines say quantitative or semi-quantitative cultures using various sample techniques are very useful. Whatever you may do, you must send a sample. That is very, very important. The preferred method for low respiratory tract sample collection depends upon the individual preferences and local expertise and cough, uh, the costs involved. The Infectious Disease Society of America also recommends the same that non-invasive sampling with semi-quantitative cultures is preferred rather than quantitative cultures, whether invasive or non-invasive sampling. But then all these microbiological samplings have their limitations. You only get a culture positive in about 10 to 20% of the patients. Even then it becomes difficult to distinguish between colonization and infection. Sometimes you're not even able to send a sample, but you have to start the antibiotic because there's no time. You wouldn't want to waste time. And of course, then there could be induction of colonization by the prior antibiotic treatment also. So what do you need? You need a biomarker. Do we have a reliable biomarker? Well, this was a study conducted for use of procalcitonin in early identification of VAP in critically ill patients. So procalcitonin was carried out on day zero. P sorry, PCT on day zero was the best predictor for proven infection in this population of ICU patients with a clinical suspicion of infection. A cutoff value of 0.44 was taken and procalcitonin variation between three days prior to day zero, the day the patient acquired infection was seen. And it was seen that the positive predictive value was a rise of 0.26 in these patients. So if the baseline was 0.44, an increase of 0.26 in the procalcitonin value, such high precision, imagine, was able to predict the presence of an underlying infection in the lungs. The CRV was elevated, TLC and fever had a poor predictive value in these patients. So definitely procalcitonin has been considered to be superior to CRP, significantly related to the severity of the disease, and procalcitonin levels increased over time in non-survivors, but decreased in the survivors. A low procalcitonin may support the impression of a viral or other non-bacterial causes, thus facilitating the decision to stop antibiotic, resulting in a lower overall antibiotic consumption. So you have non-invasive methods, non-microbiological non methods to help you diagnose VAP, the CPIS score I showed you, CRP, procalcitonin, STREM, but none of these have actually been approved by IDSA. They say they do not have much of a role However, procalcitonin may help you in monitoring the progress of the infection in these patients. What does seem to have a role and help you in early diagnosis is the use of PCR-based assays. Rapid molecular diagnostics is what is now the trend that is being followed. The reports are available within two hours. The turnaround time is very, very short. It has a high sensitivity, reduces diagnostic uncertainty, and helps guide early management decisions because it also gives you the resistance mechanisms that may be existing in the pathogen. A negative test may permit withholding of initial empiric coverage of a potential pathogen, and a positive test can allow therapy to be focused against a particular pathogen. That means if you have a negative test and supposing you're, you're wanting to cover acidobacter, but what you're getting on a PCR is supposing um, Klebsiella, then why would you want to give an anti acidobacter antibiotic? Or if you're not getting an MRSA on the PCR, then there's no need to cover the patient for gram positive unnecessarily. And a positive test can allow therapy to be focused because it also gives you the resistance pattern, whether it is NDM producing, whether it is methicillin resistant staph aureus, or whether it is uh, KPCs. And then accordingly, you can choose the antibiotic. This is what we do in our clinical practice these days. Now, coming on to the treatment of these patients with VAP. The choice of antibiotic, antiviral, antifungal, whatever you're giving would always depend on the site of infection, the resistance patterns of the expected microbes and the PKPD of the antibiotic that is being used. So <clears throat> if we were to go by the earlier classification of early onset and late onset VAP, then what was recommended was that an early onset VAP you could just give something like ceftriaxone, levofloxacillin, ampicillin, salbactam, or adapenem, 
but then we know that we encounter more of mdr pathogens now so what are the risk factors for mdr pathogens use of antibiotics in the previous 90 days presence of septic shock at the time of vap ards preceding vap five or more days of hospitalization prior to the occurrence of vap risk factors for mdr vap Uh, so, sorry, risk factors for MDR VAP would also be prior IV antibiotics. Pseudomonas would also be prior antibiotics. So these five or six factors are what you need to remember: use of antibiotics in the past, presence of septic shock, presence of ARDS, hospitalization for five or more days, and acute renal replacement therapy prior to developing VAP. These are the five risk factors that you need to remember. And give M coverage against multidrug-resistant pathogens. If there is a high prevalence of resistant gram-negative organisms to the tumor, more than ten percent, cover MRSA if it is more than fifteen percent. There is no harm in giving upfront colistin if carbonyl-resistant Enterobacteriaceae is more than twenty percent. So, what are our treatment options? These are according to the Infectious Disease Society of America, that uh, where gram-positive infections are very common. So, they recommend that you choose one drug from the group A. that is cover the gram positives one drug from group b that is a gram negative anti pseudomonal beta lactam agent like a uh, pepsilin tazobactam kefalosporin cabapenem or a monobactam <clears throat> and combine it with a third drug which may be fluoroquinolone aminoglycoside or a polymyxin these are non beta lactam but yet have good anti pseudomonal activity Fluoroquinolones we discourage from use because fluoroquinolones are potent antitubercular drugs, and in India where TB is so common, it is a very good drug that can be used in MDR TB. So we've reserved it only for those patients, and we don't use it in our settings at all. Then we have the aminoglycosides. Aminoglycosides are also not used; they are avoided primarily because of their nephrotoxicity. Most of these patients would be in sepsis, septic shock, renal dysfunction. so giving amino glycosides can be counterproductive so what usually happens is that it's a combination of polymyxin with carbapenem with a gram positive cover until you get your cultures positive so the organisms according to the indian empiric therapy guidelines for vap they also suggest the same that an anti pseudomonal carbapenem plus an amino glycoside of fluoroquinolone and cover the vancomycin but what they say very categorically is that switch to monotherapy as soon as culture reports are available and if the culture is negative then we continue with the aminoglycoside or fluoroquinolones for 5 days but not longer than that only for 5 days you can continue and then stop it when would you want to give a double anti pseudomonal cover in patients where the it's more than 10% of the isolates are resistant to an agent being considered for monotherapy where local antimicrobial susceptibility rates are not available presence of structural lung disease and in the presence of septic shock or a high risk for death uh, for the carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae we have the drug options of using meropenem doripenem polymyxins digicyclines fosfomycins when you're dealing with cre you could even consider giving high dosages of meropenem and doripenem meropenem dosage could go up to 2 grams 8 hours as a 4 hour infusion Doripenem could go up till one to two grams, eight hourly for four hour infusion. And now we also have a new drug, ceftazidime avibactam, which covers ESBL type of resistance mechanisms, AMPC, KPCs, and OXA48 as well. So these four mechanisms are covered very well with ceftazidime avibactam, but not the MBLs. Ceftazidime avibactam is a good drug for CRE, but not for, and also for pseudomonas, but not for acinetobacter. there's always been a debate about use of nebulized antibiotics the rationale behind it is that antibiotic efficacy against bacteria with purulent secretions may require antibiotic concentration more than 10 to 25 times the mic's these levels cannot be achieved with the use of iv therapy alone therefore the addition of inhaled antibiotics may be beneficial they are only used as adjuncts but not for primary therapy the studies that have been conducted with high doses of iv colistin have shown that concentration of serum is approximately the mic of acinetobacter and pseudomonas but concentration in the lungs and airways are much lower and subtherapeutic therefore colistin nebs can be used 
when you're expecting MDR organisms, where you're giving IV cholestin and polymyxin B, this could be an add-on therapy as a nebulized form. Then MRSA cover, patients being treated in units where more than 10% or 20% are staph aureus or MRSA, then you have to give an MRSA cover. In those who have received IV antibiotics in the last 90 days, any new units where the prevalence of MRSA is not known, even then you would want to give MRSA cover. MSSA is less likely in our kind of settings, especially without any risk factors. Those in ICUs where MRSA is less than 10 to 20%, you may want to give an MSSA cover where the usual even your meropenem, piperacillin, tazobactam, cefepime are sufficient, then you don't need to add another drug. But yes, if you get a culture positive for MSSA, then it would be important to give oxacillin or cefazolin as a preferred agent for treatment of proven MSSA. Can you differentiate between MSSA and MRSA? There was a study from the CT scans where they've shown that in MRSA, the peripheral GGOs and the bronchial wall thickening were more frequent as, and pleural effusion was more common, whereas in MSSA, there were more of central lobular nodules, tree and bud pattern, like TB kind of a picture, which is more common with the MSSA. The two anti-MRSA drugs are linozolid and vancomycin. And of course, the third that we use quite often is the ticoplanin. Linozolid has a faster bacterial clearances, lower histological severity of pneumonia, better pharmacokinetics, possible immunomodulatory uh, effects also, and it is associated with a higher clinical success rate. All cause 60 day fatality rates were similar in both groups where the Banco or Linozolid is used. But please remember, Linozolid is bacteriostatic, it causes thrombocytopenia, and it has a huge volume load. And mycomycin has its own side effects like nephrotoxicity, red man syndrome, and it requires drug level monitoring. Therefore, we prefer using ticoplanin. There is also a new drug which can be used now, that is a levonorgestrel, which has good anti-MRSA cover. Once you start on the therapy, the question starts is that how long to continue the therapy? Well, one way is to go by the procalcitonin that you checked on day one and follow it serially. As per this ProData trial, which is a landmark trial in uh, ICU patients, where they actually saw that they checked the procalcitonin levels. If the procalcitonin level was less than 0.25, they discouraged antibiotics. If it was more than 0.5, then antibiotics were encouraged. But then they were followed, you know, regularly at periodic intervals. And as soon as the procalcitonin level again fell to less than 0.25, or if there was a fall of more than 80% from the peak levels, then antibiotics could be stopped was what was encouraged. So with this policy of discontinuing the antibiotics when the procalcitonin levels become less than 0.25 or when there's the drop is more than 80% resulted in significantly fewer days of antibiotic consumption and not much different difference in the outcome. In fact, there was no significant difference in the mortality amongst these patients. Actually, if you see those who received in the procalcitonin group, the mortality was slightly lesser as, sorry, the overall survival was just slightly lesser, but not significant in this group of patients. If you're not monitoring procalcitonin, then what do you do? How long to give the therapy? This is a study which compared eight days versus 15 days. And they actually concluded that shorter may be better. Eight days was enough to treat these patients with. Based on which, the American Society of Guidelines and the IDSA guidelines, they categorically say seven days is sufficient, provided that the etiological agent is not pseudomonas, where you may want to extend the therapy till 14 days. So do the Canadian guidelines that seven to eight days is sufficient and pseudomonas 14 days. So this is what we also follow for all infections. We give it around seven to eight days or PCT guided. But if it is pseudomonas, then we extend the therapy to 14 days. Despite all this, the crude mortality, as I said in the beginning, also continues to be high. It is 30 to 70%, but many critically ill patients with BAP do not die of pneumonia, but rather of their underlying disease. Mortality attributable would be 33 to 50%. The increased mortality is seen in patients with bacteremia, pseudomonas or acinobacter infections. In fact, now we are seeing it even with Klebsiella, they become difficult to eradicate. 
The mortality is higher in patients who are admitted for a medical illness rather than a surgical illness, and if the in antibiotic therapy in the beginning was ineffective. So increased mortality or a poor prognosis is seen in patients with serious illness, higher Apache score, presence of bacteremia, severe underlying comorbid disease, infections caused by organisms associated with multidrug resistant pathogens. If the disease is extensive in terms of multilobar involvement, cavitations, rapidly progressive infiltrates on lung imaging, and delay in the institution of effective antimicrobial therapy. Looking at all this poor prognosis and high mortality rates, it is very important to be able to prevent the occurrence of that. So to begin with, the, the most important thing is to take care of the oral hygiene. As I said, it's the oral cavity which gets colonized very easily. So you have to keep the oral cavity clean. The two strategies that have been used to reduce colonization are selective oral decontamination involving chlorhexidine or uh, sorry, involving administration or application of antibiotics by mouth or oral hygiene, which is limited to topical oral application of antiseptics. And a meta-analysis of all the oral hygiene measures has categorically shown that they definitely benefit the patient if the oral hygiene is maintained well, whichever method may have been adapted. There was also a lot of uh, debate about the selective decontamination of the digestive tract, where they would give a combination of antibiotics orally with the hope that it would decolonize the stomach and the esophagus. But this issue is still unresolved. SDT, including topical and parenteral agents, has not shown much benefit yet, but is still under investigation. A semi-recumbent position is extremely important. The patient should always be nurtured, nursed in a propped up position because the gastroesophageal reflux would result in, uh, in micro aspirations and aspirations. Positive pressure, there's a gradient between the gastric and the esophageal compartments, that is the intra-abdominal and the intrathoracic compartment, which facilitates the reflux that is magnified further by gastric distension, <clears throat> compression by the abdominal viscera and the intra-abdominal hypertension. Regardless of the size, the presence of any gastric tube enhances the reflux by stenting open the lower esophageal sphincter. So please remember that. So even if you're put in a Riles tube or a nasogastric tube, even then the chance of aspiration are there. In fact, the transpiration are higher because now you've opened up the gastroesophageal reflux and there has been no difference seen whether the patient remains propped out at 30 degrees or 45 degrees. But whatever it is, patient should be kept propped up is what is very, very important. As I said, there's always a peritubal leakage that could happen, especially around the endotracheal cuff that could result in aspiration and pneumonia. Therefore, it is very important to keep the endotracheal cuff appropriately inflated. The appropriate pressures are 20 centimeters. Underinflated could result in increased infections. Overinflated could result in necrosis of the, tracheal, uh, of the tracheal wall and further complications. Therefore, it is very important to check the pressures in every change of shift of the nurses. Of course, you can't keep your patients NPO when they are on the ventilator just for the fear of aspiration pneumonia. And you also cannot uh, give them TPN in every situation. Therefore, the rate and volume of internal feeding should be adjusted according to avoid gastric distension. Stress ulcer prophylaxis should be avoided in order to preserve the gastric acidity. The various drugs that have been tested for stress ulcer prophylaxis, the rantidine, antacids, sucralfate, they all tend to cause problems. So sucralfate, despite a pH of more than four, lower rates of gastric colonization suggest that sucralfate may possess intrinsic active activity also, and is a preferred drug. Rantidine has been associated with 21% of the late onset pneumonias, antacid with 16%, and sucralfate with only 5%. Looking at the various medications, the PPIs or the H2 blockers, they were significantly associated with an increased risk of VAP. So use of PPIs were increased risk of VAP by 1.3 and H2 blockers with 1.2 as an odds ratio. So Shia and IDSA both recommend that H2 blockers and PPIs should be avoided in these patients who are at <clears throat> who are not at high risk of developing stress ulcers or stress gastritis. It should not be like a routine drug. You know, what has happened now is that the moment patient is admitted, 
whether you write something else or not, but a PPI is, seems to be the first drug that you would advise to your patient. In fact, there are studies which have shown that use of H2 blockers or PPIs, even in common population, common public, has resulted in an increased risk of community acquired pneumonias. So that is a potential of suppressing the acid in our stomach that could result in, uh, in pneumonia. So early initiation of elemental feeds has also been associated with increased risk of VAP. But whether it was, so the idea is that you could actually, in these patients, you could try and place the tube into the pyloric area. So when you have a post pyloric feeding, which is associated with a significant reduction in VAP as compared to a gastric placed tube. Then endotracheal tube invariably forms a biofilm around it. Now we have the silver coated endotracheal tubes, which possess broad spectrum antimicrobial properties through their nanoparticles. The single blinded trial, which has shown that patients intubated for more than 24 hours, the rate of microbiologically confirmed WAP was significantly lower with the silver coated endotracheal tube as compared to the conventional tube. The silver coated ET tube was also associated with significant delay in the occurrence of WAP. This is a usual endotracheal tube inside the airways, which gets colonized. Biofilm is formed. These small little microbes, they keep dripping off the endotracheal tube into the airways and lining up into the alveoli, causing an infection there. With the use of silver coating on these ET tubes, this biofilm is prevented. The cations, actually silver ions, attack the microorganisms present in the contaminated secretions. Silver ions elute distal to the endotracheal tube as well and keep the area clean and prevent VAP from forming. Then what is important is to continuously aspirate the subglottic secretions, especially when you're manipulating the endotracheal tube, especially when <clears throat> any procedure is to be performed. Because pooling and leakage around the endotracheal tube cuff leads to aspiration, which is very, very common. And this could be oropharyngeal secretions, stomach contents, resulting in bacteria migrating into the trachea and the lower respiratory tract. So this is a meta-analysis of 13 randomized control trials, which has shown that there was a reduction in VAP rates among patients who received aspiration of subglottic secretion. And the overall risk ratio for VAP was reduced to 0 0.55. <clears throat> Ventilatory circuits are also responsible for, uh, for introducing infection. Therefore, it is very important to reduce the changing and break in the ventilatory circuits. There is no need to be changing it every 24 to 48 hours. <clears throat> and uh, you could even extend the circuit if it is not soiled to up till seven days without any significant impact. Not changing the ventilator circuit altogether had no impact on VAP compared to routine changes every seven days also. So the bottom line is do not interfere with the circuit unless it is apparently dirty, soiled, with secretions, or has, in it, or is, has moisture in it. Then HME, the heat moist, moisture exchangers have been used for years. They were designed basically to reduce the bacterial colonization by eliminating the condensation within the circuit. Although the ventilator circuits typically are contaminated by the same organisms colonizing the patient's lungs, condensation nevertheless provides a medium for bacterial growth. So unaffected by the antibiotic therapy, this microbial reservoir is a persistent source for pulmonary re-inoculation. So if you leave it there, it's a permanent source for re-inoculation. So convincing evidence that these strategies are superior to active humidification alone in reducing VAP remain elusive though, but we've now moved on to these HME filters where there is less condensation, less chances of um, the bacterial colonization in the area. Then again, to reduce the chances of VAP, one could prefer using closed suctioning system. The open endotracheal suction may cause VAP as disconnecting the circuit increases the risk of inadvertent contamination as, it, as a circuit usually comes in contact with the bed, with the, the nurse's hands, or the endotracheal tube may become colonized accidentally by a contaminated surface. So closed system circuits totally obviate these potential sources. Although the, they are at a higher risk for bacterial contamination than open systems, this has not translated into increased VAP risk so far. The most important way of preventing VAP can be by reducing the duration of mechanical ventilation. You reduce the days, automatically the chances of VAP go down. The majority of VAP cases are late onset, that is more than four days. So if you extubate the patient 
below less than four days, then the chances are lower. The maximum charges are between sixth and eighth day of ventilation. Therefore, it is important to keep reevaluating the patient every day. Give the patient a daily sedation interruption in the morning hours and a spontaneous breath trial every morning as a protocol. This will help you assess whether the patient is ready for extubation or not. <clears throat> and therefore prevent a late on VAP from developing. In addition to this, it is important to educate the personnel, the healthcare workers about how to keep the environment clean, hand hygiene, give the patients and the doctors and the healthcare workers vaccination for influenza, pneumococcal infections, especially in the elders. Keep the, the environment clean. Hand hygiene forms a very essential part, even in preventing WAPs. Protective gowns, gloves, especially while you're intubating the patient, you should be in proper aseptic gear when you're doing that. The infrastructural issues need to be looked into and adequate staffing is very, very important in preventing WAP. This is a simple mnemonic that you could remember as steps to prevention of WAP. Chose no WAP, where C is for craft pressure of 20 to 30 centimeters, H is for a head and elevated of 30 to 45 degrees, O is for oral decontamination using chlorhexidine, S is for suctioning the subglottic secretions and stress ulcer prophylaxis with supralfate, and E is for internal feeds. That is chose in internal feeds in a controlled, regulated manner, not allowing the abdominal bloating or distension to happen. No is no saline lavage, and O is for orotracheal intubation, always a not a nasotracheal intubation. When you do a nasotracheal intubation, then the chances are that you would block the sinuses, result in sinusitis, and result in VAP. Then B is for ventilatory circuits to be changed only if needed. A is to avoid heavy sedation and heavy continuous sedation and paralysis. Give them a sedation-free interval and be able to assess them from time to time. And finally, P is for prophylaxis for DVT. Good practices also include a good plasma control of sugars, avoid blood products unless very necessary, and use orogastric tubes rather than nasogastric tubes and orotracheal intubation. To summarize it all for you, ventilator-associated pneumonia is a significant public health issue in India with a very high mortality. The pathogenesis basically includes sterilization of the aerodigestive tract, tracheal injury, inoculation in an appropriate host with all the risk factors, pooling of secretions in the subglottic region with the biofilm formation and colonization of the trachea, especially if the patient is in a supine position, large gastric aspirate resulting in aspiration, resulting in WAP. Contaminated hands, gloves, respiratory devices, and water could result in inhalational, uh, uh, inhalation of contaminants into the airways, again resulting in WAP. And then a very small percentage of patients develop WAP from bacteremia, or translocation of bacteria from the gut. When would you suspect it? You would suspect it when a patient who's been hospitalized and is on mechanical ventilation for more than 48 hours, develops a new onset fever with progressive infiltrates on radiography and has at least two of the following features. Fever, leukocytosis or leukopenia, altered mental status, purulent sputum, worsening of gas exchanges, and a new onset of worsening cough or dyspnea raise a bronchial breathing on examination. In all these patients, it is very important to send semi quantitative cultures, whether they're bronchoscopic or non-bronchoscopic, whatever is available, you must send. <clears throat> Severity of illness and risk for resistance determine the initial empiric therapy. Seven days of therapy may suffice for most cases of VAP, HAP, and combination therapy is de-escalated to targeted monotherapy as soon as the culture reports are positive, available. WAP is important to prevent, and the simple WAP bundle, which comprises elevation of head end, sedation free period, spontaneous breath trials, DVT prophylaxis, oral care with chlorhexidine, and structural prophylaxis using supralfate, reduce the incidence of WAP significantly. With these words, I'd like to thank you all for hearing me patiently on this part on the WAP. I think we'll just take a short break while you could put up your questions if you have any, and then we'll move on to the next part of the evening, which will be on aspiration pneumonia. So I'll just give you a small break, sir. I'll just, uh, you know, say a few things, <laughs> take a breather. <laughs> so guys, put up the questions. Uh, thank you for that, sir. Very nice slides. And uh, I'll just uh, bring out some trivia. 
So guys, uh, this is for you. And uh, how many of you think that the lung failure gamma in a normal human being is uh, sterile? Would you like to answer that? Can you put that up in the chat box? If anybody wants to answer that. Is the lung parenchyma steroid in a normal human being? We are not talking about the airways. Okay. So, uh, some of you may know this, but I am sure most of you would not know this because this has come up in the last couple of years that the lung parenchyma is not actually steroid. There is a microbiota in the, in the lung also, just like you have in the gut. And this is a protective uh, microbiota comprising mainly of anaerobic organisms and certain other organisms. So what happens is uh, this microbiota protects against the development of pneumonia. However, in conditions of chronic lung disease or chronic systemic diseases like long-standing diabetes, CKD, you have an alteration in this microbiota and thereby the person is predisposed to pneumonia. So it is important to understand this concept. So some general information, general concepts. Okay, now coming to another uh, bit of trivia. Now, it uh, might sound interesting again. As you are sitting and breathing, do you think you are breathing in any bacteria or any viruses or any fungi? Anybody wants to answer that again? You know, if you are sitting here, are you breathing in any air? Are you breathing in air? Is there any bacteria going in? That is again relevant. So, very good, Vamshi. So, <laughs> Vamshi, how many bacteria are you breathing in per minute? Very good. Approximate, I know that's a difficult one. I'll give you an MCQ. 10, 100, 1000, more than 1000. So, more than 1000, okay. So, that's a difficult one. The fact that you've answered that you are inhaling bacteria, viruses, or fungi is very good. So, approximately, you've taken 100 bacteria mainly, some viruses, and maybe some fungal spores. So, this is relevant because you see, we have an oropharyngeal uh, flora. And if you look at the textbooks or literature, uh, there is a core oropharyngeal flora, but then there are certain organisms which textbooks will say will never occur, and then other textbooks will say you can have these organisms. So what happens is the oral oropharyngeal flora is not constant. It changes according to your environment, your habitat. So what air you breathe in continuously changes the oropharyngeal flora. And this is the oropharyngeal flora which you aspirate in community acquired pneumonia generally which causes your community acquired pneumonia, the etiology. That is a concept, again, which has to be understood. Very good, Vamshi. Now, <clears throat> coming to another thing. About uh, uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. You know, uh, we have this definition, Sergey, but uh, <laughs> the problem here is uh, all the clinical signs may not be there. You know, leukocytosis and all these things are very vague sometimes. And we often rely on infiltrates and uh, the increase in but uh, please be aware that in a study carried out in a well-documented study and published in the literature, 50% of new infiltrates on the X-ray are non-infectious, right? Maybe atelectasis, maybe edema, or whatever. So please be aware of this when you interpret new infiltrates on the X-ray. And uh, the diagnosis of uh, WAP has to be made cautiously. Just like leukocytosis is 50% non-infectious in the IC. Now, another thing. Why does the oropharyngeal flora change in the ICU? So there are many factors. First of all, you know, the oral hygiene is poor. Secondly, many of these are intubated. They're handled by nurses, healthcare workers, and they are colonized with gram-negative infections, gram-negative bacteria in our country, in our ICUs. We don't really have gram-positive. Gram-positive is in the West. So they get transmitted, these gram-negative bugs. Then antibiotic use. Most of the patients will be getting antibiotics. So this again changes the oral flora. And oral hygiene, sir, had said that you get gingivitis and uh, all those things. So that again changes the flora from anaerobic to predominantly gram negative. Then the critical nature of the disease, the systemic disease, it alters the immune system, the immune defense mechanisms. And <clears throat> of course, uh, the use of PPIs, the rampant use of PPIs, which uh, uh, alters the pH of the stomach, and which leads to growth of the more resistant gram negative organisms. And they get aspirated. So all these factors lead to gram-negative organisms colonization. It is in our ICU, where gram-positive is very less. And thereby, you get this aspiration and gram-negative uh, with red associated pneumonia or gram-negative aspiration pneumonia. Now, just taking that forward, please, Sarit also said, please do not write PPI for everybody. We had a lecture on upper GI bleed. PPIs have very specific indications. And apart from the incidence of VAP, to AKI, it has been recognized. They also cause AKI, which further progresses on to CKD. Siren kind of disease goes on, and they result in CKD. <clears throat> 
So please write PPI only very specifically. Now another point I want to uh, take forward from Sir's lecture was about Canada. So Canada, like Sir said, is a colonizer. Canada from the airways does not cause Canada pneumonia. In fact, Canada pneumonia is a very rare entity. And if it does occur, it occurs from candidemia, bloodstream infection. Right? So there you'll have Canada, either cultures positive or multifocal Canada colonization. So do not treat Canada in the respiratory uh, tract in the specimens. Canada actually is a colonizer unless there's a very heavy growth where you can get sometimes tracheobronchitis or it may be disposed to pseudomonas like such. So those are very specific settings. But I've seen, you know, fluminous oil being added at the drop of a hat uh, rapidly wherever you get Canada in the respiratory tract. So just a few points from my side, sir, and uh, please carry on with your second uh, point. I think you've highlighted it really, very well. Thank you, Dr. Pradesh, for your contribution. <clears throat> Shall we start with the next part? Then? Yeah, 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 please. Now, friends, coming on to inspiration pneumonia. So we've already discussed a lot about endovagal intubation, aspiration, aspiration, aspiration. This is a different kind of an aspiration. The aspiration pneumonia that we're talking about now is basically a continuum that includes community acquired as well as hospital acquired pneumonias. It accounts for nearly five to 15% of the cases from the community acquired pneumonias. But figure for hospital acquired pneumonias are unavailable because of lack of studies or lack of being able to identify that how did this patient in the ICU resulted in pneumonia except when the patient has a frank vomiting. Otherwise, you would not get to know. So in a retrospective study performed on 628 patients with aspiration pneumonia, the 30-day mortality was 221%. A robust diagnostic criteria for aspiration pneumonia is lacking. And as a result, studies of this disorder include heterogeneous patient populations. The study also showed that CURB-65, which is a predictor of mortality in community-acquired pneumonia, is not a reliable indicator for aspiration pneumonia. So aspiration pneumonia is a distinct entity altogether. It may be a continuum of CAP or HAP, but we still don't know that how many, what percentage of patients in a hospital acquired this infection. So, but what we need to remember is that this pneumonia occurs as a complication following general anesthesia in one in every 2000 to 3000 cases. A study conducted on individuals older than 65 years who underwent a CABG or any other cardiovascular surgery showed that the incidence of aspiration pneumonia was almost 10% with 12 of the 123 patients developing aspiration pneumonia after extubation. Another case control study showed that the incidence of aspiration pneumonia was 18% in nursing home patients and 15% in community acquired settings. Since most cases of aspiration pneumonia are silent or unwitnessed, we do not know the true incidence of this entity. But of course, the pathophysiology, as the, the name itself suggests, is the aspiration of the oropharyngeal secretions or the gastric secretions into the lungs, the aerodigestive tract into the lungs. So there is obviously an inhibition of the mucociliary mechanism and the alveolar macrophages. The normal defense mechanisms are fail to happen in this individual. The entry of the fluid into the bronchi and alveolar spaces triggers off an anti-inflammatory response. There's a release of pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, interleukins. There's also an inoculation of the organisms of common flora from the oropharynx, the esophagus, and that result in an infectious process. So what you see is a biphasic response. There's an initial corrosive response because of the acidic pH followed by a neutrophil mediated inflammatory response, which happens about four hours later. The initial corrosive response starts within minutes of the aspiration happening. This classically happens in patients who have an impaired swallowing reflex or an impaired conscious level. Impaired swallowing reflex may be seen in patients with uh, say an esophageal disease like a cancer, dysphagia, stricture, they're unable to swallow, they tend to cough, they tend to vomit, and it goes into the lungs. COPD patients, elders, where you try to force feed the patients. We've seen so many patients with seizures developing aspiration pneumonia, Parkinson's, stroke, dementia, where they're mentally obtunded. Patients who are on mechanical ventilation, <clears throat> impaired neurological states like stroke, cardiac arrest, medication that sedate a patient, general anesthesia, alcohol consumption, they all can increase the chances 
of macro aspiration into the lungs. A patient suffering with gastroesophageal reflux, patient on tube feeding, as I told you previously also, when you have a nasogastric tube, you're actually increasing the chances of aspiration because now you're opening up the gastroesophageal sphincter and leaving it open because of the presence of the, the Riles tube or the feeding tube. Then of course, there may be medication which suppress the patient's cough reflex, not allowing the patient to cough off the foreign body that is being aspirated. It could be alcohol, stroke, dementia, degenerative neurological diseases or impaired consciousness. So these are all the various risk factors that could result in aspiration. Additional factors could be a mechanical disruption of the glottic closure or esophageal stringture, like the patient is on tracheostomy, endotracheal intubation, has a head and neck cancer, is undergoing a bronchoscopy or an upper GI endoscopy or is on nasogastric feeds. Then there are patients who are receiving pharyngeal anesthesia. Sometimes when patients have incessant coughing, we give them a xylocaine nebulization. And xylocaine nebulization locally anesthetizes the upper airways and controls the cough. But please remember when you're doing this, you must tell the patient not to have anything one hour before and for two hours after that. Because once it's all numb, then the patient will never get to know if the patient aspirates. Protracted vomiting, large volume tube feeds, feeding gastrostomies, recumbent position, and near drowning situation can all result in aspiration. Of course, poor dental hygiene, aspiration in the setting is associated with a higher inoculants of oral flora. As people grow, their reflexes become obtunded and the chance of aspiration go on increasing. Cardiac arrest is a very interesting situation where it's presumably due to loss of consciousness as well as aspiration of the oropharyngeal and gastric contents in the context of CPR being done or a bag valve mask ventilation being done and emergent intubation. This was a study of 641 patients with cardiac arrest and pneumonia developed within three days after the event in 65% of the patients. Two intervention studies involving comatose patients showed that there was a benefit of administering prophylactic antibiotics for up to 24 hours after an emergency intubation. Because obviously when it's an inter emergency intubation, then you do not take care of the asepsis at times and tend to be in a rush to save the life. And you may actually harm by causing a pneumonia in these patients. <clears throat> it has also been seen that therapeutic hypothermia to 33 degrees was used for some cardiac patients and the chances of developing early onset pneumonia rose by a factor of 1.9 in these patients. However, a target temperature of 36 degrees may be associated with a lower risk of pneumonia. So aspiration can result in three clinical syndromes, a chemical pneumonitis, a bacterial aspiration pneumonia, or an airway obstruction. Chemical pneumonitis or aspiration pneumonitis, as we call it, is basically aspiration of substances like gastric acid <clears throat> that cause an inflammatory reaction, but do not cause an infection. On the other hand, bacterial aspiration pneumonia, as the name suggests, refers to an active infective process that is going on following inoculation of a large amounts of bacteria into the lungs via the orogastric route. And then you have the airway obstruction. The aspiration of fluid or particulate matter that could obstruct the airways and thus result in an infection distal to it. So chemical aspiration was first described by Mendelssohn in 1946. It was in fact taught to us as a Mendelssohn syndrome. Chemical aspiration pneumonitis also occurs perioperatively. It most often occurs during intubation or extubation for anesthesia or during procedures like laryngoscopy. In his original series, he described 61 obstetric patients who aspirated gastric contents during the ether anesthesia that was used then. Despite the initial severity of illness, all 61 had a rapid clinical recovery within 24 to 36 hours with radiographic resolution within four to seven days without the use of antimicrobial therapy. So the pathophysiology of chemical pneumonitis is that it's actually been tested in experimental animals using intratracheal installation of acid. The inoculum with a pH of less than 7.25 and uh, sorry, a pH of less than 2.5 and relatively large volume is what is needed to cause chemical pneumonitis. That should be one to four ml per kg body weight. So that means in adult humans, about 70 ml of gastric content would be required to cause a chemical pneumonitis. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> while the smaller volumes may produce a more subtle process that either escapes clinical detection or causes a less permanent form of pneumonitis. The clinical observation that patients with esophageal or gastric reflux experience frequent bouts of regular pneumonitis often accompanied by pulmonary fibrosis supports this concept. So we see patients who develop an interstitial lung disease following micro aspirations, which have been occurring over a long period of time, over months to years. And as I told you earlier also, that bile may also elicit an inflammatory response in these patients. This is one such patient who developed an interstitial lung disease with bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis following chronic micro aspirations into the lungs. <clears throat> this is a rapidly evolving phenomena that happens. Within three minutes, there is atelectasis, peribronchial hemorrhage, pulmonary edema, and degeneration of bronchial epithelial cells, which could result in a release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, especially TNF-alpha and IL-8. By four hours, the alveolar spaces are filled with polymorphonuclear leukocytes and fibrin, resulting in hyaline membrane formation within 48 hours, resulting in a grossly edematous and hemorrhagic lungs with alveolar consolidations. The clinical features would be abrupt onset of symptoms, such as dyspnea, cough, hypoxemia, tachycardia in a patient with risk factors for aspiration, fever, which is usually low grade, and there would be diffuse crackles or wheeze on lung auscultation. Radiology will depend on the, basically on the site where the contents have been aspirated. Right lower lobe is most frequently involved. If the aspiration occurs in an upright position, then it's the lower lobes or bilateral involvement. If the patient was in a recumbent position, then it's usually the superior segments of the lower lobe and the posterior segments of the upper lobe. If it is in the left lateral decubitus position, then it's a left-sided infiltrates. If the patient was prone or is an alcoholic, then the, 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 <clears throat> the aspirated contents could go into the right upper lobe also. But a minority of patients may not even develop any, any radiological change, while some may develop an acute respiratory distress syndrome with diffuse opacities bilaterally. Natural reflex in a patient with chemical pneumonitis would be to use steroids. However, studies have not shown any clear benefit with the use of steroids. Empiric antibiotics have been studied in various studies where 30 to 26% of the patients with observed aspiration events acquired pulmonary superinfections. Therefore, what we practice is to give them an antibiotic, observe the progress in the next 24, 48, 72 hours, and then reevaluate the need for continued antibiotic or not. Then the second aspect would be aspiration bacterial pneumonia, which is caused by bacteria that normally reside in the upper airways or the stomach. They're historically referred to an infection caused by less virulent bacteria, primarily the oral anaerobes, the streptococci, which are common constituents of the normal oral flora. However, more recent studies have shown, as even Dr. Tapesh was mentioning, that as soon as a patient gets into the hospital with all the antibiotics, use of PPIs, there's a complete change in the oropharyngeal flora as well. So the anaerobic bacteria are now replaced by the more resistant bugs that we encounter in our ICU. The MRSA, the pseudomonas, and the other aerobic and facultative gram-negative bacilli. In fact, there is a study which is actually shown based on sequencing of bacterial 16S ribosomal, ribosomal RNA genes and metagenomics that the oral microbiota in patients with acute stroke, they were able to identify 103 different bacterial phylotypes and 29 of which had not even been reported previously ever. Now, whether these are pathogenic or not is still uncertain. But bacteria may colonize various sites such as gingiva, dental plaques, and tongue. And the pathogenic bacteria include gram-negative species that are seen in the normal host now. And they may emerge in the elderly as well as in patients in nursing homes or hospitals and those with nasogastric tubes. Spectrum is changing, as I said. In a prospective study of 95 patients, gram-negative bacteria was seen in 49% and anaerobic bacteria in only 16%. In a study of 212 Japanese patients with lung abscess, streptococci were seen in 60% and anaerobes in 26%. In hospital-acquired settings, anaerobes appear to be less common. Streptococci, Staph aureus, and GNB are the organisms that predominate. 
So a classical clinical features of an anaerobic infection would be indolent symptoms, absence of rigors, predisposing condition of aspiration, usually com compromised consciousness due to drug abuse, alcoholism, or anesthesia or dysphagia, concurrent evidence of a periodontal disease, sputum that often has a putrid odor, and failure to recover likely path pulmonary pathogens with the cultures that are taken. So if you fail to recover a culture, then you could consider it to be an anaerobic infection and treat accordingly. The characteristic clinical history has to be taken into consideration while forming a diagnosis along with the risk factors and compatible findings on radiology to reach a diagnosis. So in about 28% of the patients, pneumonia was confirmed only on CD scan and not on radiogram. So absence of... Uh, <clears throat> absence of any patch on the x-ray, but the entire clinical setting being there should not discourage you from the diagnosis of aspiration pneumonia. These are the various radiological pictures. In fact, again, there could be totally varied pictures that you could get in case of aspiration pneumonia also. Alpha amylase is a biomarker which has been tested, but not found to be reliably indicative of an aspiration pneumonia. <clears throat> Bronchoscopy is indicated when particles of food have been aspirated. The technique also allows the retrieval of organisms for culture. Usually when you do bronchoscopy, you're able to clear up the airways very quickly and may be able to avoid the progression into a severe pneumonia. I'm not sure of that yet. <clears throat> but it does give you an early diagnosis as to what you're dealing with, especially when you're using the PCR-based technology like the biofire and all. Bronchoscopically, you would see erythema, purulent secretions, blood clots. In fact, you could even get a bilious kind of a tinge in some patients where it's a biliary aspiration. This was a study of an early bronchoscopy that was carried out in these patients. 76 adults, mechanically, well, well, mechanically ventilated due to my, um, aspiration pneumonitis. Half of the subjects received early bronchoscopy in the first 24 hours after aspiration. And what was seen was that in the intervention group, there was a significant reduction in the rate of development of pneumonia at 60% versus 81.6% through the first week of admission. Sorry, not just that, the mean WBC count was lower in those who underwent bronchoscopy. The hypoxia index was better in the patients who underwent bronchoscopy. CPIS score was lower and SOFA score was also lower in patients who underwent bronchoscopy as compared to those who did not go undergo bronchoscopy. Again, more important than that was that the antibiotics could be modified according to the bronchoscopic cultures in a larger number of patients who underwent bronchoscopy than those who could not, obviously because of lack of diagnosis that you had. And then again, if you see overall the success rate with bronchoscopy intervention was higher, the ICU days were lesser, and the outcome was better in these patients. <clears throat> so the treatment of these patients would entail elevating the head end of the patient. Pa sorry, patient's position should be corrected. The head end should be elevated always to 45 degrees. Suctioning of the oropharyngeal contents, provide them with oxygen or immediate intubation if the patient is not maintaining with oxygen support, urgent bronchoscopy and antibiotics are initiated immediately. The choice of antibiotics would again depend on the site of acquisition, whether it's in the community or in the hospital. When you're dealing with hospital, you would deal with the MDR bugs automatically that we just discussed in VAP. They would be similar for HAP also. If you want to cover the anaerobes, then clindamycin is a better drug than metronidazole. In case of MDR infections, an aminoglycoside or cholestin may be used as a part of the combination regime. In addition to vancomycin or linozolid, if the patient has documented nasal or respiratory colonization with MRSA. So this is a whole chart which has been provided uh, an algorithm that if it is community acquired infection with an abnormal chest radiograph with poor dental health, then you give them either an ampicillbactam, amoxiclav, or a fluoroquinolone. If the dental health is normal, then again you could use the similar antibiotics. But if the chest x ray is clear and the illness is only mild to moderate, you could hold and not give any antibiotics, allow the body to respond on their own. However, if it is a severe illness, then you may want to treat accordingly and treat the source also. If there's a dental abscess, treat that 
as well. And consider bronchoscopy in these patients to guide the antibiotic therapy. Then again, in patients who have acquired in the hospital, if it is a clear chest radiograph, again, you could wait for some time, but then do not delay it also the question in these patients. Sometimes the illness could worsen rapidly. And as I told you that in 25% of the patients, you may not get anything on the chest X-ray. So the clinical setting is very, very important to decide what you need to do. The duration of treatment would be similar to what you do in CAP, HAP and WAP, five to seven days to up to eight days is usually sufficient, provided the patient has a good clinical response and no evidence of extra pulmonary infection and longer treatment for those who develop necrotizing pneumonia or lung abscess or empyema, which could even go up till two to four to six weeks sometimes. And in the case of lung abscess or empyema, drainage of the diagnostic, drainage for diagnostic and treatment purposes may be needed. I mean, sorry, this is not for lung abscess. For lung abscess, you would want to do a bronchoscopy. For empyema, you would want to do a, a drainage for diagnosis as well as for treatment. But please remember, glucocorticoids are not recommended. Antibiotics may be avoided if it is mild illness, but it may be worthwhile giving the antibiotics for the first 48 hours and then reconsidering after 48 hours, whether you need to continue or not. And in more serious cases, antibiotics should be started early, empirically. And again, every two to three days, you could consider whether you want to continue or you don't want to continue. The complications include ARDS, empyema, lung abscess, paranemonic effusions, respiratory failures, multi-organ dysfunction. The prognosis is usually worse than uh, community acquired pneumonias. 29% versus 11.6%. What is also important is that if it is a large volume aspirate, it could result in asphyxiation and death instantaneously if the patient is unable to cough up. The third syndrome that you can encounter is a mechanical obstruction. Fluids like saline, barium, the most ingested fluids like water, gastric content with a pH exceeding 2.5 are usually well tolerated by the lungs. They're usually not a problem. But solid particle aspiration like food particles could result in a severe inflammatory cascade. Foreign body aspiration, especially in children, could also be catastrophic in many cases. We ourselves have aspirated peanuts, almonds, uh, black pepper seeds, covers, you know, the distal cover of a ballpoint pen from the airways of children, teeth, these are very common things to be aspirated into the airways. Lipoid pneumonia is also another um, kind of a pneumonia which is caused by aspiration of mineral oil. It is more of a chemical pneumonitis again. Mineral oil is usually taken to treat constipation or used intranasally as a vehicle for decongestant or as a home remedy for nasal dryness. It's most commonly seen in elders who have extremes of age. They are at a risk of aspiration. It results in an inflammatory response with regional edema, intraalveolar hemorrhage, or even the development of a paraffinoma where the aspirated oil is encapsulated by a fibrous tissue. It has been hypothesized that exogenous lipoid pneumonia may be precipitated in some events with e-cigarette or vaping also. This is associated with lung injury due to inhalation of heated oils as some investigators have noted lipid-laden macrophages in the bowel of these patients. The diagnosis is largely based on CD findings, which are often more extensive than expected based on the symptomatology. There could be GGOs, thickened intralveolar septa, crazy paving patterns, and air bronchograms. <clears throat> Areas of consolidation containing foci of fat attenuation are a characteristic feature. Bile in these patients may repeal, uh, reveal lipid-laden macrophages with large vacuoles that stain positive with oil red O stain, although this finding is non-specific and may be falsely negative, but then this could be positive also. The treatment would be cessation of exposure. For patients with more severe disease, you could try steroids. For refractory cases, you could consider whole lung lavage as you do it for pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. What is important is again prevention of aspiration pneumonia, antibiotic therapy for 24 hours in comatose patients after emergency intubation should be given, no food for at least eight hours and no clear liquids for at least two hours before elective surgery with general anesthesia. It should be considered in appropriate clinical settings to evaluate the swallowing of the patients. 
preference for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors for blood pressure control after stroke oral care with brushing and removal of poorly maintained teeth feeding in a semi recumbent position for patients with stroke is very very essential oral chlorhexidine can also be used to prevent aspirations also further that if patients are unable to swallow then you prefer giving them thickened liquids rather than giving them liquid and feed them in a chin down position that may reduce the uh, the aspiration risk then nasogastric tubes is uncertain in a study involving 1260 patients 630 patients with a nasogastric tube in place did not have more aspiration events than during endoscopic observation of swallowing than 630 patients who did not have a nasogastric tube post pyloric feeding is also not superior to gastric feeding and monitoring of post feeding residual volume may not minimize the risk of aspiration so to summarize i would say aspiration pneumonia refers to the adverse pulmonary consequences that result from aspiration of fluid particulate exogenous substances or endogenous secretions into the lower airways the common clinical features that should raise suspicion for aspiration pneumonia include sudden onset dyspnea fever hypoxemia radiological findings in a patient who's predisposed to developing aspiration the common side would depend on the position the patient was in when the aspiration occurred and so will the radiological findings but they may take 2 hours after aspiration to show early bronchoscopy can reveal erythematous bronchi and give you an op- give you the opportunity of identifying the infection and antibodies would be given in most situations but only judiciously to be monitored every 2 to 3 days for continuation of antibiotics or not thank you again for a very patient hearing i'll be happy to take any questions so thank you sir please stop your share screen so uh, wonderful slides as usual sir very colorful and uh, very detailed uh, coverage of the topic thank you very much that was a lot of effort uh, there will be one question i answered that uh, that was uh, earlier on there no more questions just two points from my side <clears throat> uh, one uh, that uh, uh, when you Have a clinical suspicion of an aspiration episode, then you look at the X-ray the next day. It will be clear. So you think that there has been no <coughs> aspiration clinically in the sense that there is no pneumonia. But uh, please be aware that sometimes or many a time it takes 48 to 72 hours for the radiological appearance of an aspiration pneumonia. So you should be aware of that. And uh, one thing about the nebulization part of cholestin and uh, amikacin. So this was a paper published last year in uh, Intensive Care Medicine. wherein they did some animal studies it was ethical studies ethical consultations for it in uh, humans and they found definitely there was a distinct advantage in combining uh, iv cholestin with nebulized cholestin 4.5 million bd nebulized cholestin with iv 4.5 bd and uh, for simple reason that iv cholestin does not reach the lung parenchyma so there you can combine 4.9 million iv and 9 million uh, this thing uh, nebulized and nebulized cholestin does not reach toxic levels in the serum Uh, the other antibody can use is amikacin and amikacin however uh, does reach uh, toxic levels in the serum can reach if you use it in nebulized form so it should not be combined with another nephrotoxic iv drug so just a couple of points from my side sir and uh, just uh, we we'll wait for two minutes if there are any questions uh, anything you want to add sir no oh, that's it yeah thank you so much thank you for this opportunity really it has really been uh, nice I, i think there are no questions and uh, we shall uh, uh, end the webinar with that The next one would be on plural effusions. So thank you, Dr. Nagya sir. Thank you very much. See you again sometime. Bye. Take care.